there is a paper uh, in your pack of stuff that I wrote, and uh, or what I wrote, and um, I'm going to, not. I'm not going to read it because that would be really, really dull. What I'm going to try and do is um, to illustrate it uh, with some stories that uh, maybe, hopefully, bring it alive a little bit as uh, as we go through. And I. If you've had a chance to read it, I think it was circulated around, that's good. If you haven't, I'm sure you could probably read it in the time I'm going to warble on up here at the front, okay? Um, if you're a multitasker. So, uh, I want to begin this uh, reflection with um, a story from my days of learning Swahili in Tanzania, um, which probably was the the place I have been most disabled in my life because I could not do anything uh, as a mission partner sent by the church in the UK to work alongside uh, in partnership with the Diocese of Mount Kilimanjaro before I'd learned Kiswahili. I knew, I knew one word of Kiswahili when I went. <laughs> Yambo. <laughs> and after, uh, after about a year, you're in the most dangerous position when you're learning a new language because you know some stuff, but you don't really know enough um, to make it work for you and uh, our kids were small at the time and we had to go and buy we wanted to make a sand pit in our back garden so we went to the builder's merchant um, and we wanted half a ton of sand and we went to the builder's merchant and we said please uh, Mr Builder's Merchant could you give us half a ton of oranges please <laughs> <laughs> and he said no, we don't sell oranges here. You need to go to the market for those. No, we want half a ton of oranges. No, go to the market. You can imagine the, how the conversation went. And eventually we realised that the word for oranges is machungwa and the word for sand is mchanga. And we hadn't quite got it right. And we never, ever forgot. We never, ever, ever <laughs> forgot the words for sand and oranges again. And the, the ability uh, to be consciously incompetent um, when you're crossing cultures, uh, I think is the, is the key to some, some, some of this work. Uh, the, the, the people who get some of the stuff I do around the, around the country fastest are the people who've crossed another culture and lived somewhere else, or people who've done um, open youth work because <laughs> that's another culture in itself and uh, and it's it's because they've learned that thing of you have to learn the language and you have to be disabled as you do that and make all those really really ridiculous mistakes and uh, not get it right and and that's that that, that thing of of actually disempowerment I think um, that we've perhaps a feeling our way towards uh, on this day. Um, I, I explained a little bit in the paper about, about um, how I understand power and authority and I'm indebted very much there to the Grubb Institute. Uh, for those of you who aren't aware, the Grubb Institute existed uh, from the time of Bruce Reed in the uh, 1970s up to a few years ago when unfortunately uh, it lost its way and uh, ended its life. Um, although I suppose the mantle continues with uh, the Tavistock Institute. Um, the Grub was much more a faith-based organisation and the Tavistock isn't. But nevertheless, uh, the, the approach to understanding systems and organisations I think is a very important one. And, and I do think that the idea that power is actually a neutral thing is really important because I know it gets abused and I know we find those... Um, those texts like this at the end uh, where it looks like power is, is being exercised difficult um, and I think there's a way of understanding power that could work for us um, as opposed to some kind of uh, feeling that it's really just a bit dirty and nasty to get into all those uh, questions and, and the idea that uh, power uh, could actually grow and increase and give you uh, something that you didn't have before, I think, is exhibited by community organising approaches. And uh, 
I don't know whether Anna may say something more about asset-based uh, community development later on, but uh, that's clearly one approach. The, the other that we're familiar with now in the UK is uh, the citizens model. Did you know about Citizens UK? So um, it started with a man called Saul Alinsky, uh, who worked in the Industrial Areas Foundation from the 1940s to the 1970s in America, um, creating power in civil society. So it's called broad-based community organising, and it's, it's specifically political, but it's not party political. So it's about how you create power in public space to hold the state and the market to account for the good of everybody. Because in his theory, the state and the market will colonise the public space if you allow them to do that. And an individual cannot, does, has, has no power um, in public space if, if um, you're on your own. They will just pick you off. That's what they want, because they want to colonise that space. So, um, Kim Jong-un came in this model to the UK in the 1990s. I think he got stuck in London, uh, fairly typically, for uh, about 15 years. And um, in about 2008-9, um, we were living in Nottingham and my wife uh, became very angry about the removal of some uh, asylum, Pakistani Christian asylum seekers at four o'clock in the morning to Yarlswood. And she discovered there was a campaign that Citizens UK were running to, uh, to get the government to uh, outlaw the detention of children, which currently was legal. And uh, she started uh, with some other people developing uh, in Nottingham Citizens UK and within three to four years we had 42 member organizations across uh, Muslim, Jewish, Christian uh, groups, unions, schools, university departments um, and several other places as well including a fairly radical feminist organization. They represented 90,000 people in advance of the 2015 election, we had 2,309, the nine's important because that broke the health and safety rules, <laughs> in the Theatre Royal in Nottingham, uh, holding the, um, the government, the local council and local businesses to account for the good of the city of Nottingham. It was the, the closest I think I've been in my life possibly to actually feeling somewhere here the kingdom of God at hand. It was a remarkable event, and not least because um, the churches were represented heavily in the room, but not in that colonial kind of way of telling people what to do. It was, it, it was, uh, it was power, um, and we had somehow created the authority um, that went with the, the system we had created, and the the city council. Nothing has been Labour since you know the year dot and the city council leader was as one of our colleagues said bricking it before he went on um, because this wasn't hustings this wasn't the Labour Party thing where he could play to the crowd this was the citizens saying we're going to do about this this and this and it's our agenda it's not yours that was really really something to watch so Power is something that we need to take account of. And this is because um, if it is just the ability to get something done, then, then that's what God does. He makes the world. He creates the world. The spirit uh, is very powerful, the most powerful being in the universe. We, we are caught up in that if we are Christian in some way. Can we, can we understand that? Can we be part of it? So I always want to start with God in these conversations because um, I think it's the first shift we have to make in, uh, in the church today for, for all sorts of reasons. Um, 
We have to start being able to name, notice and name the activity of God in public. And, and it's a really, really difficult thing to do. My, my favourite story of this is, uh, again, from Nottingham when I was there, and I worked in some churches uh, in North Nottingham. And uh, in our little group, we had uh, the organiser of a thing called Nottingham Circle came to visit us. And uh, Nottingham Circle is a, is a self-organising group for the over 50s. Um, and and it's just not like the U3A. It's not you know nice middle class people getting together and doing things together. It really is self organising, and so they they just get them in the room and facilitate them into working out what what they're going to do together. And it works in all sorts of areas of Nottingham, but you you know other less salubrious areas. And, and there was uh, he, this guy who told us this story of one man from a place called Bulwell. Ever been in Nottingham? Uh, Bull Bull <laughs> is uh, is a particular area which is um, yeah very working class background, and this guy said the thing that that this organisation has done for me is he said I used to it used to take me half an hour to go shopping, and it now takes me three hours. <laughs> I, I wanted to. Say, I, I thought about it at the time and I didn't say, oh, I really think that's amazing that you've created the ability for people to form relationships such that it takes three hours to go shopping. I'm sure God is pleased about that. I wanted to say that and I didn't. Mm. It's really hard to speak about the activity of God in public. We have... As, as my friend uh, who taught me some of this stuff says, um, he says, if the government passed a law that said we weren't allowed to speak in public about God, then we'd all start doing it. <laughs> <laughs> but because they haven't, we've somehow imprisoned ourselves in, in, in a cell of our own. Um, we, we just don't do it. It's just too embarrassing to talk about. We had a really interesting conversation at... Uh, um, uh, the Susanna Wesley Foundation Church Consult uh, meeting last week with a bunch of clergy and lay people around uh, is it okay uh, to do this? Is, is it not just presumptuous um, to speak about God? And, and part of this is is the what I would call the, the, the capture, the cultural captivity of the church in modernity so I speak about that in the paper and then um, the, the way in which we've given in to the private-public split that, that uh, modernity created for us and uh, how hard it is to, um, to break out of, of, of that privatisation of the church. I'll tell you about Charlotte, um, who's a member of a church, um, a fairly middle-class church in, in Nottingham. And uh, they went through our our change process and in the middle of the process we asked them to create an adaptive challenge something that they don't get the answer to I'll speak about that again in the paper and they knew in this parish that they had an area in the parish called Furbank uh, in Nottingham and they knew they'd never done anything in this place they knew it was different to the rest of the parish it was much more deprived social housing and They'd always felt guilty about it for years and years and years, and they decided to make it their challenge. Could they form some relationships and work with these people to uh, to work on community in that area? So we we asked them, we give them a little process of, of helping them to, to find people who they might, we call them people of peace, they might actually relate to, connect with, and, uh, and then form a meeting to discuss what, what they might do together. So Charlotte described in front of everybody uh, in, in the room as they were reflecting on this experience um, how she was so terrified by this idea um, that uh, she decided to write a script of uh, what she was going to say when she rang up the person that had been given to her as her contact in this community. Because it, the, it, the, it was what made it safe for her to be able to make the phone call. <clears throat> And she described uh, in fine detail the, uh, the phone call. She rings up and the woman answers. So, 
got to get going. She said after about 30 seconds, she knew it wasn't going very well because she got for the first three points and this one was no idea who she was and very awkward. And then she got to the line where it said, and, oh, I'm, and I'm from so-and-so church. And the woman said, really, she said, been waiting for someone from your church to ring for 20 years. <laughs> <laughs> so, so they had a 40 minute conversation about how they might partner together. Um, and once that story got told in that church, you can imagine what happened then about their understanding of the way in which God is at work outside the church and not just inside the church. People are waiting for us for 20 years to be in touch. Wow. But it's really, really hard to make that phone call, to make that contact. It's terrifying. I've watched people do displacement activity for months other than do that. I mean, there was a one church where they wrote a course on the Holy Spirit of, to, to distract them from actually going to meet some people in their community. It's just the way it is. And, and these adaptive challenges are really important because, because they do that same thing of disabling us, as, as I, perhaps I was saying you know, about my learning of another language. They, they help us to, to deal with um, that thing of trying to fix stuff technically. We, we live out of modernity when we had great progress from science and technology. Of course our lives are better, but the world is so complex now, um, the emergent, as we, as we said at the beginning, um, that we have to do uh, adaptive change. Another example of this from Leicester Diocese. Uh, there's a church in Leicester Diocese in a place called Humberstone. If you go there, it's a medieval church, and they have these massive trees that surround the church. So it's really hard to see the church building uh, from anywhere in the community. And over the last 20, 30 years, the community has become 65% non-Christian faith. So Muslims, Sikhs and Hindus have moved out of Leicester into the parish. So this church spent 18 months denying this reality that was out there. They, they kept saying to us, look, all we need is children and young people in our church. They didn't have any. If only we could get children and young people into our church, then everything will be fine. And couldn't you give us some money for that? To the diocese, it was into the diocese. Couldn't we get a children's work? And, of course, um, there are ten ways to get children and people into a church. It's a technical thing. It's not difficult. And the question is, what are you going to do with them when you've got them? And generally, of course, churches tend to freeze them out because they, have, they change the nature of the way things are. So we were pretty convinced that that wasn't the answer to their question. The, the question they had to ask themselves was, how are they going to deal with this reality that was out there now, which they were clearly in denial about. Eventually, they clicked that they had to do something about it. There was one person in the church who'd made a relationship with her Hindu neighbor across the fence. And because this woman was key to um, the leadership in the church, she took her experience and they essentially scaled that up over the next three, four or five years and such that the whole church now has a relationship with all the religious communities uh, in the parish. They were able to make the shift but it took a really long time. None of this, none of this is really very easy. It, it requires um, <laughs> I think, a dying uh, to the old ways and um, new things emerging. And that's why I speak about the, the theory you in the paper. Some of you may be familiar with that, might say a bit more about it if you want at some point later on. Um, 
But my, my example of that is um, another story from uh, the church I was in in North Nottingham. Um, one of the churches uh, was in a place called Bestwood. And uh, when, we, uh, when I arrived there in 2010, um, it was run by essentially about 10 or 12 white working class ladies of a certain age. They were the church council. And uh, we introduced this practice of dwelling in the word. And uh, we invite churches to stay with the same text for a whole year and to do that practice at the beginning of their uh, church council meetings and any other place they can find to practice it in the church. And, uh, and I suppose because uh, the people who led the church on the church council were the people they were, they kind of went along with it for a couple of years and had two passages to work with. And then one day, uh, one of them came to me and said, Nigel, me and my friends hate dwelling in the world. We want to stop. We hate it. It's too hard. It's too hard to get something out of the passage every time. And it's too hard to listen to somebody else. Well, no one ever said you had to get anything out of the passage every time. Actually, it's not. That's not what we said. I just have to notice where your attention is drawn. If it isn't, then just say so. But anyway, um, so uh, hmm. so this was uh, interesting <laughs> because because uh, I knew we needed to to have what we might call the come to Jesus conversation about this practice. What was what was going to happen if it was her and her friends who hated this? So I, I tried, of course, the initial pushback and nothing happened. I just got another tirade of anxiety about it. So then I tried putting it off to the next meeting and uh, another classic clergy tactic didn't work either. And uh, so then I knew we had to have the conversation. So I got everybody in on the church council to describe their experience of, of the practice. It turned out, of course, that it was her and her friend um, who hated it. And there's another lady uh, on the church council who um, was probably semi-literate and, and actually was older and didn't see very well. She said, this has changed completely the, my relationship with the Bible. I can listen to the word of God being read and hear it and speak about it and have other people hear that too. It's transformed the way I understand the Bible. And, and several other people said you know, positive things and in, in between those two opposing views. And then Christine spoke up. Christine uh, is in, was about, about 70 at that stage and uh, she'd had very, two very autistic children. She'd had a very tough life. Her husband had left her. And uh, she brought up these children, one of whom hardly communicated at all. But she said, well, she said, it was hard for Jesus. He died on the cross. Why wouldn't it be hard for us? <laughs> I, I, could have, I could have kissed her. <laughs> because here was... You know, proper theology being made uh, in that really difficult conversation about is this too hard for us to do? Is this journey that we are on to believing this is God's work and not our work, is it worth persevering with? Is it worth staying with? And, and actually it was. And something shifted in the way that church council began uh, worked after that moment. The lady who hated it left and did some other stuff in the church, which was great work, um, but it clearly wasn't her thing. But that shifted uh, such that we had a, by that stage, we had a bunch of uh, African diaspora uh, people joining the church, and we, we then managed to get them onto the church council. And we actually had fun 
on the church council after that. We, I mean, remarkably, I used to look forward to going to church council meetings because somehow we were able to speak about the activity of God together in a way that was impossible before we'd had that really, really difficult conversation. And, and that's the shift I think I'm, I'm trying to talk about in this paper, that, that we have to hold people through those really difficult dark places in order for the new to emerge. That's the view of you. You've got to go to desolation. You've got to go to, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me before the new will emerge? I think that's probably enough I need to say for now. Thank you for listening. Thank you.